I invite back to stage Michael Miller, John Miller, and the incredible and amazing Alec Baldwin. Come on up, guys! specifically on behalf of the three of you, starting, of course, with the two brothers. Uh, and then Alex came in very early on. So if you can talk a little bit, um, and it's really for the, either one of you, um, about the journey, the, the, the creative process that took you together from the, the, the world on the script to what we saw here on the screen. And I know it, it was a long time in the making. Who, who would like to start first? Um, well, uh, I think as we mentioned earlier, uh, we started this process what, 10, 12 years ago. And at the time, um, you know, I was producing the film and, and raising money. And, you know, like everything in the movie business, you know, you can come this close and it never happens. And uh, that happened a few times. Uh, this movie had a few incarnations. And um, I sort of had gotten uh, fatigued by that process with this project. I sort of put it on the shelf. And a couple of years ago, I, I had um, I was on the set of a movie I was producing. I actually premiered here called Friends and Romans. And I got allergic to my set, which was the first time that I'd ever experienced that. Normally, I love being on set. I'm, you know, a set animal type of producer. And I just, I couldn't do it anymore. It was like the, the same routines, the same conversations, the same complaints, you know, it was just killing me. And I s sat down and I said, I gotta do something different. I gotta direct a movie. And of course the movie that made sense was the script that my brother wrote that I developed with him all those years past. And of course, um, having worked with Alec on a documentary called Seduced and Abandoned, um, he knew me well enough to accept the script when I sent it to him. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, the, the script went through, I mean, Alec is obviously an incredibly insightful um, intellectual person who <laughs> brought the, in addition to his Trump impersonation, um, he, brought, he brought the script to another level, uh, as did to me. Uh, you know, it was, everything in the movie business is collaborative. It's never one person, one concept. It's constantly evolving and changing. And, you know, you're as good as, as the people who are with you on it, and I was blessed to have someone with the talents of Alec. <coughs> uh, to, uh, to, to echo what my brother is saying, like, my favorite part about making movies is that no one person makes a movie, but everyone's got their role. Everyone's got what they are supposed to do. And um, when you uh, are the screenwriter, or as my father used to call it, the Talboy in the Whorehouse, when he's lucky to get paid. Uh, generally speaking, you're not on set every day, you're not doing that. This was a case where um, we were working with such an incredible cast, and we had a very tight budget, and every day I would get to set, and I would see my brother, the director, and he would say, so, this scene's not gonna work as written. <laughs> And I would say, why? I'd say, well, we don't, we don't have the location. Can you, can you change the location? Say, mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Wrote it for 12 years. Happy to just, you know, work this out. We change it right now. What do you mean? Um, and there was just, there was so many different problems that needed to be solved. Now, I, uh, I, I've had a, 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 the privilege of getting to work with a number of masters of their craft out there, and uh, I feel very blessed for it. But I have to say, I've never, ever had the privilege of working with a master who is as generous 
with sharing his wisdom as, as Alec was and teaching and coaching and coming up with songs I could never have imagined and the collaborative feel that we had on this movie, the entire army that got together to make this movie uh, was so fulfilling and nurturing and I feel like for you know, the whole crew and everyone who was there, what we ended up getting on the screen is just, it, 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 it melts my heart, it makes me sing and Alec, I learned so much from working with you on this and thank you for being so generous with us all. Um, I think it goes without saying when you hear the two of them talk that having the producer-director uh, uh, make a film and the writer is his brother, it comes in handy. Because um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of times writers are uh, disappointed with how the film is realized and there's a lot of pressure to maybe change things to suit the mouth of the cast and so forth. But the two of them uh, were on the film a battery that really helped to just move everything along because you know when you make films today it's hard. It's a lot of work and uh, it's a lot of stress to get the thing developed and cast it and get the crew and the budget of the locations and, uh, and, and you know the fact that we're here with the film screening at a festival. We're miles, I was telling somebody outside, we're miles ahead of uh, a lot of our friends who are still trying to get their movies made. I mean, getting a movie made is really, really tough. But uh, I love the idea that the blindness of the character really was secondary to what I was appealing to me about the story, which was to fall in love later in life and to believe that you could have that in your uh, later in life. I met my wife uh, when I was in my 50s and uh, I got married again and uh, my wife and I have three kids. And um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you don't have to applaud me for that. <laughs> uh, that was some of the easiest work I've ever done in my life. But, um, the, uh, but the, uh, um, the, but the, uh, but the, the, I'll just finish with this, which is that, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, that's what appealed to me, that story of, uh, of a man uh, with some bitterness and some, uh, you know, beaten about by life and, and blind. I mean, that was the, the, the secondary part. I tried to play it in my mind sometimes, like, well, he's not blind. And just, he just wants what he wants and happens to be blind. And I thought the writing was beautiful in terms of that, that this is someone who's trying to have love in his life. The two of them are both trying to have love in their life uh, a bit later in life. I mean, I said to Demi, let's do a sequel. Let's have John write a sequel in which we have sex and we have like, this violent sex scene and I can see again when we're done. <laughs> we literally, me, to the point where I can see my sight is regained. I, I think that's, get on there in your spare time. <laughs> I'd like to open it now to questions from the audience, but I want to ask you also direct the questions just about the film, nothing else. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Alex, how are you? Is it you, Luba? Yes! Oh, my God! <laughs> now, listen, what I want to know is what physical um, <clears throat> preparation did you do to play someone who was blind? We went to, by the way, Luba, when I went to, she's tired of me saying this in the, in the two times that we uh, passed in the night here in New York, uh, when I went to acting school through NYU at Strasbourg, we had a movement uh, requirement. We had to take movement. And we took, we, we had our movement classes were taught by Luba Ash, our movement teacher, who then came to me and said, uh, and like all, all, I found that all like ballet mistresses and all like dance uh, 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 captains, so to speak, in the New York world, really are more uh, James Cagney than they are uh, you know, some delicate flower. You know, Luba, when she walked up, she was like, you want to be in my dance company? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm not really a dancer. She's like, yeah, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll all take care of itself. We'll work it all out. And I go to this thing. We did a dance recital. And the only reason I was in the dance class was I was the only guy that could lift the girl. <laughs> so I would come out like this. I would come out like this. would run out, I'd pick her up, I'd put her up in the air, I'd put her down, and I was like... <laughs> and, I would, and I would go off, that's all I had to do, and I was in your ballet company. 
I was in a ballet company. The thing we did was we went to the Lighthouse, which is over near Lincoln Center, which, which merged with the Jewish Center for the Blind. They are one organization now, correct? And, uh, uh, they, and they're about to move from their location now to another location we told them West End Avenue. But we went there and we spoke with many people who are blind. And we talked to people who are congenitally blind and they were struck blind from some occurrence or some accident. And we talked to about a half a dozen, five or a half a dozen people at length. And what was it like to date? And what was it like? And uh, you know, well, how do you communicate in that way between a man and a woman? And uh, many, many questions that would take me quite a while to to uh, index here, but uh, we had a lot of time with people who were blind. And then Debbie and I walked out the door with our coach, and I had my eyes covered, and we walked around Central Park blind. And you do automatically, right away, sound becomes, and the acoustics become very, very primary, and, and touch, walking on sand, walking on gravel, walking on grass, walking on, and everything that happens becomes, you know, you get into the interior of the park and it's quieter. Suddenly there's more noise, and go, are we leaving the park now? And you just start to pick up on all these things about the, the common sense of being blind. And then the people took us through the life of people who were blind. And, uh, um, and there was one guy we interviewed who was like, you know, I mean, I don't want to be, uh, you know, I don't want to get it wrong, but then this guy was like, he had girlfriends jumping out of the trees. I mean, he was blind, <laughs> but he was like a real ladies' man. He was like this guy, he had like, he had like 10 girlfriends and all the time, and he was like, Everything in with him was going great, being blind, to not get in the way of anything in his life at all. So, um. I, I just want to add something. When the two of them strolled through Central Park, uh, this was told to me later, so I was say I wasn't there. They were so much in character that no one recognized them. They were basically unmolested as they walked through the park, which uh, is an interesting note on, on the, the, uh, the absorption that they had in the parks. But when you see people who are blind, for me, you know, they really do that kind of, uh, you know, what my mother, what we jokingly call Ayurvedic listening, you know. They were like sitting there and that's the, and, and, and they're, they're so active in the way that they would listen to us talking and the way that their body was listening and, they, and the things they pick up about people. Like this one guy said to me, he said, he said, he said I would take the woman by the hand. That's a huge thing when you're dating a woman in the blind world. He said, I would take the woman by the hand. And he goes, and I would know. And I said to the woman the same thing. She, she goes, yes, yes, she, she goes, she goes and, 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 and you know when that time is there between you go through this whole ballet, if you will, before someone reaches to hold you. And that is the line they cross. That's the moment when they send a signal to each other that they want to have a different kind of relationship. Anybody else? Well, I, I, you know, he wasn't um, what they call MPV, no uh, perception, NLP, no light perception. Um, he could see shapes or sizes because if he was completely blind and you could never really make eye contact, you can't tell a love story between two people who can't make eye contact with each other. And they had us wear different lenses. They brought in kits and said, well, this is what, do you think from what the script and what the director have uh, uh, described to you, is this what you are, and is this what you are? And they kept putting different lenses on these glasses and different filters until finally you saw, well, you could see the mask, the shape of someone's face, their head, almost like a blank, you know, like, a, I don't, you know, like an oval of some kind, and their hair, and almost none of the skin tone. There might be a little bit of a distinction between the hair and the skin, and none of their features, none of their, their features at all, their eyes, but you, you see a shape, a very blurry shape. <laughs> no. You're saying that the sparkle in my eyes is not in the film? <laughs> what the hell is the matter with you? <laughs> Lots of sparkle.
see the film eventually. You're going to be in the kitchen having a snack at 2 o'clock in the morning, and if you have a TV in the kitchen, you turn it on and you go, oh, look at that. And it's a movie you made 15 years ago, and you almost never remember in movie making the details of making the scenes themselves, the scene, sometimes. But the scene work is kind of a, it's kind of, you know, castles in the sand kind of thing, and that memory erodes, because it's not like the theater where you do it again and again and again. Sometimes you'll sit and watch a movie, and you'll sit there and go, I remember that day. That's the day I had a flat on the Ventura Freeway on my way to work. <laughs> and I had to call triple. You remember the day of shooting, but not necessarily the work itself. In this film, I would say the most uh, memorable scenes, one was in the apartment when I, we have to kiss for the first time. Because uh, that was, it's what the movie's about. And you have to, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of competent women that could have played this part. There's a lot of competent men. You know, the older you get in this business, you realize there's so many great actors out there, and great actresses who could play different parts. And, uh, but I've known Demi for many, many years. We've been friends, we've been friends of friends, and we've run into each other and then not seen each other for a while. We made a movie in 1995, so we made this movie 20 years later. And I would say that uh, to make a movie again with Demi, uh, probably all of my scenes I mean, I enjoyed working with uh, all of the actors, but my scenes with Demi, it was really very uh, touching to make a movie again with her 20 years after I made a movie with her. Uh, this kind of tepid little thriller we did called The Juror. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, I don't know, very strange movie, but, 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 but I, to do a movie with her again, and of course we agree we want to do another movie 20 years from now as well. So. <laughs> To, uh, to go back to what you were saying about the twinkle, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think you can take the twinkle out of your eyes, but I did notice when we were making the movie, um, you know, when we were chatting backstage and we, you hadn't gone on yet, you would do this thing. I had no idea how you did it, but I could tell when you were blind and it was the subtlest shift. It, it, was, it was wild and it was one of those energetic, tonal, it's not as though your eyes went crossed or whatnot. It was just a difference and I think that's, that's the magic. But I was also thinking about what you were saying about the sequel to this. <laughs> How do you feel about doing it with Whoopi Goldberg? That we call it colorblind. very good question because you could have ended the movie quite easily with Alec alone at the table with um, what he thinks to be the love of his life never coming to see him or never finding him. No. And, you know, it would have been a very kind of resonant, um, slightly cold but stoic <laughs> ending. You know, uh, Bill would have been, you know, uh, obviously re redeemed with his book and, and his life back together. And, to me, well, we don't know what would happen to her, but, you know, it's a love story. And I think, you know, when you tell an old-fashioned love story, which this is, you, you got to deliver on the goods. And, uh, <laughs>
there's the main love story, there's the different relationships. A lot of this was about mentors and mentories, about handing down, and so we have the juxtaposition between Mark and Bill, and one of the ways in which we, we understand how these guys are so different is in how they are with their, the, the people they're mentoring. So, now I will say when I, when I first wrote this script, I, I wrote the part of Gavin for myself. And I, I like this idea of being the young ingenue writer. And by the time we make it, I'm playing the janitor. <laughs> which, which, which was a blessing, which was a blessing. So. But you were a janitor with a lot of sparkle in your eyes. <laughs> Tremendous. Tremendous. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Give a I want, I want to thank John, Michael, and Alec for coming here. It was a true treat. And I wish you lots and lots of luck for the film. Stay in touch and let us know what's going on with it. And thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Good night.